Hello and welcome back to Guillotine 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today I thought we'd talk a little bit about the ion, since um, in this next unit of bonding and structure, we really don't get to talk a whole lot about our, our friend, the charged particle. And so this, this would, it's a great time to review the idea of what makes an ion, and the terms uh, electron configuration, and, uh, and the idea of being isoelectric with somebody. And so when we think about ionic compounds, we often remember that atoms will gain or lose electrons to get a full outer shell, to get isoelectric with the closest noble gas. Now, if you've been paying attention in the last couple lessons, uh, what we have is the outermost S and P subshells uh, involved in bonding the valence electrons. Now, th these, these outermost S and P hybridize into orbitals of equivalent energy, and that's why we can have eight electrons uh, most of the time in a valence shell instead of two or just six. And again, that's a little beyond the scale of maybe a first year chemistry class, but it, it happens. Um, but nonetheless, let's, let's look at this in terms of noble gas abbreviations. So go ahead, pause the video and, and write the noble gas abbreviations for sodium and chlorine. I'll be waiting for you. Okay, welcome back. Sodium is going to want to be a 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. So that'd be a neon 3s1 because we take the first 10 electrons and chalk them up to neon there. Chlorine, on the other hand, is going to want to be, again, a neon 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And then we'll add seven electrons onto that in the 3s2 and the 3p5. Now, if you uh, aren't, aren't sure about this or you don't remember this, you can go back and check out the, or the videos about orbital diagrams and electron configurations and even noble gas abbreviations. See the handy order filling chart and how they fill. Now you're used to seeing, you are used to seeing sodium as this. It has the idea of sodium yields uh, Na plus plus an electron, but it is useful at times to think of it this way. That again, you really think of it as elect, uh, neon's electron configuration. Stripping an electron away gives it neon's electron configuration. Remember, it doesn't become neon because it doesn't change the number of protons. In the term of cl chlorine here, chlorine's going to want to gain an electron. Uh, so it's going to go from a 2s2, I mean from a 3s2, 3p5, all the way up to a 3s2, 3p8. I mean 3p6, which gives you 8 electrons in its outer shell. And that'll end up being a one-to-one -one ratio, and that's why sodium chloride is going to be electrical neutral when it's NaCl. So we can try another one here. Go ahead and try it out for aluminum and oxygen. Um, again, I'll wait for you on the other side. So welcome back. Aluminum here is going to be, again, neon, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And then you're going to throw on three more electrons. They'll go in the 3s2 and the 3p1. Uh, oxygen, on the other hand, is going to be uh, 1s2, 2s2, and then stop the 2p4, uh, six electrons in its valence shell. So aluminum is going to want to lose three electrons to become isoelectric with neon. Again, we can look at that in terms of the electron configuration. Stripping those away gives its neon's electron configuration. And oxygen is going to want to gain two to become isoelectric with neon from the other side. So that'll be, again, helium, 2s2, 2p6, which, again, would be eight electrons in the valence shell. And so we're dealing with the fact that aluminum has a plus 3 charge, oxygen has a negative 2 charge, and so you'd need two positive 3 charges to balance out three negative 2 charges. And so that formula would be Al2O3. Hopefully that's a review for you. A couple other things that are probably a review for you. Remember that ionic compounds are going to be formed in a 3D crystal lattice, and it's a crystal lattice made up of tiny unit cells. Unit cells being the smallest part of the crystal lattice that still, I guess, uh, portrays the entire 3D structure. We talked about simple cubic, body-centered, face-centered cubic, but there's many other unit cells out there depending on the shape of the crystal. Remember that cations tend to be a little smaller than what they came from. Anions tend to be a little larger because uh, charge isn't changing, but the number of electrons is, which is changing the electron repulsion and the pull of those electrons from the protons. And so they're either going to spread out a little bit more if there's more electrons or get pulled in a little tighter if there's less electrons. Remember that many transition metals are capable of multiple charges dealing with uh, the D subshell. Uh, and, and again, this isn't too hard to look up if you're interested in this kind of supplemental information. Uh, the answers are out there, <laughs> so don't, don't stop looking if you want to. And then finally, remember, of course, polyatomics are groups of covalently bonded atoms that as a whole 
uh, gained or lost electrons to get full outer shells. And uh, we did talk about this earlier in the year at Polyatomics, but but uh, never hurts to review a little bit. And you'll see them come back uh, with a roar here soon as we start talking about how things are actually bonded to each other. So this is a great time to review some other stuff. Go ahead and figure out what the charges of each of these ions and what they would become isoelectric with. All right, so rubidium is going to want to get a plus one charge. It'll become isoelectric with krypton. Selenium is going to want to get a minus two charge. That'll make it isoelectric with krypton from the other way. Magnesium is an alkaline earth metal. It wants to lose two electrons, and that's going to get it isoelectric with neon. Gallium is going to want to lose three electrons. It's an aluminum family. It's going to become isoelectric with argon when it does so. Bromine is going to want to gain one electron. That's going to give it a minus one charge, makes it, make it isoelectric with krypton. And then we've got some ionic compounds here. So go ahead and name those. So beryllium, again, as an alkaline metal, is going to have a plus two charge. Bromide, as a halogen, is going to have a minus one charge. So we'll need two bromides to balance out one beryllium. Ferric hydroxide, as you remember, is a plus three charge. Hydroxide's a minus one, so you'll need three minus one charges to balance out the plus three charge of iron. Uh, ammonium bicarbonate's a little trickier because you're dealing with poly polyatomics. Ammonium's NH4+. Plus. Carbonate would be CO3 2 minus, but remember bi on the front of a polyatomic means that it's going to be HCO3, uh, so it's going to take away one of the negative charges, so that's going to be HCO3 with a minus one charge, and so they'll balance out one to one. Finally, we've got some going the other way, so go ahead and name these. Okay, so uh, again, the first one, if you forgot the uh, cobalt's a multiple charge cation, uh, you can figure out what that charge is pretty easy. Bromide's got a minus one charge, so three of them is going to give you a negative three, so cobalt's going to have to be a plus three charge. Uh, ClO is two less than the base polyatomic of chlorate is ClO3, so chlorite would be ClO2, and hypochlorite would be ClO with a minus one charge still. So you'd need one sodium, sodium hypochlorite, to balance that out. Again, if you want to review that, that's back in the naming lessons. And then finally, uh, lithium's going to have a plus one charge. Acetate's going to have a minus one charge. So you'll need one lithium to balance out that giant polyatomic of an acetate. So I hope that helped uh, tie some stuff together, see some stuff from some different perspectives. Ionic ions are certainly important, although, again, certainly take a back seat in this unit also. Uh, so anyway, uh, we'll get on to a lot of good stuff about covalent compounds here. Uh, thanks for watching, and have a great day.